In this podcast, we'll take you on a journey where you will discover that at the junction of tech and copyright, while we are living in a digital age with unlimited potential, many walls have come up, making it more difficult for users and creators to access, share, and reuse what is available online and offline. This journey will take many stops. We're interviewing a variety of people, ranging from internet entrepreneurs to librarians and publishing professionals, from digital rights activists to sci-fi writers. And we ask them how copyright and tech affect their daily lives and ours. In this episode, our guest is Mirela Ronchevic. Mirela is a publishing professional with over 25 years of experience in the publishing and library in publishing and libraries. She worked with many companies and organizations worldwide, launching innovative projects related to ebooks and digital content. And she also holds a PhD in information science with a focus on open libraries and digital publishing. Mirella owns and curates the wonderful site No Shelf Required, a virtual space where everything related to the present and future of digital content is open to discussion, particularly as it relates to books, both scholarly and popular, journals, and various digital resources used in the scholarly community and in libraries worldwide. Welcome, Mirella. Thank you, Gwen. Nice Hi. to be here. So let's... <laughs> Thank you very much for being. Thank you very much for joining us. Erecting paywalls to protect content is a practice applied by news and scientific publishers for ages, and the entire open science movement is based on frustration about these practices. Um, maybe uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about this open science movement and on how researchers and their funders are trying to get around these paywalls. Yes, yes, happy to do that. In fact, I spent the last few years. Even though I've worked with a variety of um, digital publishers, popular and academic, as well as a variety of libraries, including public and academic, the last few years I've specifically devoted to researching the impact of uh, open access publishing and open science and the various business models that we use on the academic publishing side that help us uh, open books to students and researchers and scholars worldwide. Um, it's been a long journey that started, I'd say about 20 or so years ago, uh, and it was actually the scholars, the scholarly community, uh, having been frustrated with the many limitations that they faced as authors trying to get their work uh, published uh, and then disseminated and distributed to colleagues around the world. Uh, they were the original creators of the movement that began uh, at the turn of the century, whose goal was to open science and to make it uh, a global phenomenon so that researchers worldwide can benefit from sharing each other's um, findings and scholarship. We've come a long way since then as an industry. Uh, we've experimented with many different business models. Uh, I would say that we are still learning and learning from mistakes. Uh, and those who have experimented the most in our industry, I would say have gone the furthest um, and have given us in recent years, us meaning the whole book industry and the scholarly community, uh, a lot more options uh, and a lot more hope that uh, as we forge ahead uh, into the next, into this coming decade, more and more uh, books and journals uh, will be made available uh, freely and without restriction, and of course, fully legally. Um, it all started with journals, as you may know, um, open the open access movement, open science for, for many, many years was always discussed in the context of uh, scholarly journals. However, in recent, in about, in the last eight or so years, uh, we've done a lot more with books, with scholarly monographs, and we now have a wide variety of business models that publishers use uh, and, and, and to <clears throat> publish content that is uh, fully available uh, and at the same time protected properly so that uh, the rights of authors and publishers are not being violated, violated in any way. We still have ways to go. Uh, we're not anywhere near finished. And uh, when we get to that point where we know everything, I, I don't know. But I, I can see, having been um, involved in these many uh, projects and initiatives, um, we've certainly, as an industry, expanded. And 
even the publishers and authors who initially were a bit more reluctant and difficult to convince to come on board and embrace the idea of open science and open book, open access publishing have slowly uh, opened up. And uh, I think it's safe to say that at this point that every major publisher, uh, every major academic publisher in the world and many, many university presses and independent academic publishers are embracing open access publishing and open science and working with libraries and scholars to figure out how best to open content, to make it at the same time uh, profitable for them and uh, useful to the scholarly community. You've, um, you've already touched this um, because of course, when, when, we t when we talk about open science and open access, um, like at least I think the first thing I think about is journal articles and, and data sets mm -hmm. and things like that. Can you mm -hmm. briefly explain like what's, what's so special about monographs and books in the, in the, um, yeah, the scholarly, scholarly monographs and books? This is my favorite topic <laughs> uh, at the moment because it's been, you know, under researched and it, this is something that I took on in my own PhD research in recent years because the scholarly monograph is, is a valuable entity in the scholarly community, particularly on the HSS side, meaning humanities and social sciences. When we think of academic publishing, we always think of it in terms of STEM and HSS. And those are very different fields. You know, STEM fields tend to be more oriented toward, if not exclusively, toward the journal format because they involve um, scholarly disciplines that age faster. Uh, they need that uh, immediacy and, and speed of, of publishing that is, is afforded to, to scholars through um, journals. Uh, but on the HSS side, on the arts and humanities and social sciences side, with disciplines like history, literature, anthropology, communications, etc., it's, it's, it, the monograph is still the golden standard. Uh, it's always been, as uh, someone once said, if it didn't matter, we wouldn't be asking PhD students to still write a full-blown 80,000 word thesis. Uh, it is a long form art, a long form scholarship that has always had a special place in academia. It's, it is how HSS scholars have been able to get tenure, get promoted, um, retain rep reputation, publish uh, with prestigious um, publishing houses, et cetera, et cetera. And so as we've seen in recent years with various open access uh, book initiatives, and actually in Europe, especially, I mean, the, Europe is, is sort of like the cradle of it more than the United States. We've come to realize that there is a lot of potential and that the scholarly community very much supports. At first, it was a bit um, confusing to us all. Oh, how do we apply open access publishing models to books? Because with the journals, it was, it was a much easier transition. Scholars, as you know, who publish in journals usually do not get paid anyway, and it's a completely different set of rules. On the book side, authors have always been paid for their hard work, usually, which you know, it takes about a year, if not many years, to, to assemble a monograph. So the same models that, are, that worked for journals would not work for monographs. So, so new models had to be developed, um, and I've been involved with some of those initiatives, uh, particularly the crowdfunding initiatives that involve libraries joining forces uh, to join global consortiums uh, and finance uh, the publishing of these monographs. They, they have, uh, these initiatives have been around for several years now and they're proving to have staying power. So what literature shows us and the research we have available up to this point is that uh, it's a promising model and um, it's proving to, to, it's gained not only a reputation in the library industry, but also a large following among libraries and universities around the world. And those <clears throat> crowdfunding initiatives sometimes work within specific disciplines where you have scholars in a specific disciplines joining forces and their own institutions setting aside funds to support the publishing mm -hmm. of certain number of books in, within a certain discipline, or you have multidisciplinary uh, initiatives that involve uh, publishers on, you know, multi various publishers joining forces together to create these multidisciplinary HSS disciplines 
uh, monographs touching on all kinds of topics that libraries worldwide can participate on an annual basis. Yeah, so, so we've seen indeed like relatively successful crowdfunding initiatives as a business model. Like I think we see it in Open Library of Humanities and, and in Knowledge Unlatched, for example. Knowledge Unlatched, correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and just, in the US, Unglue It. Unglue It, yes, of course. And and just out mm -hmm. of curiosity, do you do you see any any other types of of interesting business models emerge? Because when I think about these new business models, I always think about this crowdfunding. But maybe there's or this like this. Um, this, uh, yes, yes, in fact, uh, yes, uh, there is, uh, there are many, there are many, and those of us who are, you know, with the, the insiders, if you will, we, we, we experiment with many more models than most people mm -hmm. realize. It's just that most people don't realize that a lot of them don't make it. So yeah. they just kind of come and go. And then those that do, you know, have the staying power and we, we, we uh, launch them over and over again. And so there are some new ones that I think are very promising. One of them is called Opening the Future, which was just launched by Frances Pinter, who was actually the original founder of Knowledge Unlatched. And she is now heading the uh, Central European University Press. And their Opening the Future model is very interesting. It's also monographed its books, but um, when we've seen this on the journal side uh, to make these so to open content, it's the, the, the big word is always sustainability, right? How do we make these models sustainable for everybody? Sustainable for authors to keep them interested in producing quality content for publishers, to keep them interested in wanting to publish because they have to recoup their cost. And anyone who's ever worked in publishing can tell you what that entails. And it truly is a process. Um, and I am a big believer in everything publishers do from uh, you know, acquiring and, and soliciting content to, to editing it and, and packaging and, and distributing through proper channels. Um, and so what we've seen with, uh, with uh, the op uh, new, these new models like Opening the Future is that they're starting to, they're, they're taking some lessons and clues from the journal side. So on the journal side, uh, to make, uh, we've been experimenting with a model called Subscribe to Open in recent years. It's basically libraries still subscribing to the journals they've always subscribed to, but the money that is used uh, to cover the cost of uh, keeping these journals going it makes, it, it makes it possible to keep those journals open usually for two to three years. So in other words, uh, the idea of subscribing, libraries continue subscribing for the benefit of not just, you know, keeping these journals um, going, but for the benefit of opening them to the wider public. So now we're seeing the same thing happening on the book side. For example, Opening the Future is trying to do just that. Libraries can subscribe to the backlist mm -hmm. uh, of a certain collection and the money that is used from those, the money that they uh, contribute for those subscriptions is then used to open new books. So the more libraries subscribe to the backlist, the more books can be open. So there is a formula. So how much it costs mm -hmm. to open a single book. Uh, and um, I think it's an interesting model. It's brand new. It launched earlier this year, but we'll see how it goes. But I think, I think there's an interesting argument to be made for it because the idea is, uh, as, as we say in the US, there's no such thing as free lunch. We need to cover the cost of producing and, co and publishing these monographs. And if libraries and institutions are willing to set aside those funds that they've always used to subscribe, but now there's the added benefit of opening them. Uh, as you know, they, 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 uh, they have Creative Commons licenses, which means they are fully legal and um, the costs are covered. And once they become open access, like they stay open access in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So that's one model that comes okay. to mind uh, on the book side. Okay, thanks. I, I mean, thanks for this clarification. Um, let's move a little bit away from, from the strictly scholarly um, communication side mm -hmm. and just go a bit broader to towards books and literature and, uh, and digital uh, in general. Um, and one thing that caught our eye, um, like like a quite quite a, it made quite some noise last year was um, this this um, 
the publisher suing uh, the Internet Archive uh, because they mm -hmm. made uh, books digitally available during the pandemic. Um, they said because because uh, the libraries were closed, so they wanted to provide access for these books for all those people sitting at home. Um, so uh, this this makes very clear that that digital digi oh, sorry, it makes this very clear that the digitization uh, of books can provide uh, can actually pose new copyright challenges. Um, can you can you elaborate a bit on mm -hmm. that? Can you tell us a bit more? Yes. So on the academic side, because academic books, it's a, it's a completely different game. Uh, academic books in general are not sold in large quantities. So open access models that I just mentioned and some other ones, that they work rather well because we're not really dealing with bestsellers and, and books that are sold you know, in large quantities. On the popular side, it's a completely different, uh, it's a completely different narrative. It's almost like two separate worlds that don't really have anything to do with one another. So on, the, on that side, on the side of, of consumer publishing, if you will, uh, there has been tension, even much more drama, I would say, and much more friction, both between users and publishers and authors. So on the one side, you always have the content creators and distributors, which is uh, which includes authors and publishers. And on the other side, you have users, and of course, in recent years, librarians. Uh, their interests don't always um, start, they're not always in sync, and they are driven by different motives and logic. Um, it really comes down to content creators protecting um, the integrity of their work. And as you know, uh, since we've entered the digital era, and I'm not talking about the last 20 years, but going back to the 1990s when the music industry faced was the first to really to be brought down to its knees when Napster launched and, and people started to share mp3 files and it took a few years for the music industry to really get it all sorted out and and to protect and and to re to, to completely transform itself to this point where we're at today and people forget that we didn't always just have free access to music on youtube it, it, it was a long road to get to that point um and so what happened on the book side the book industry wanted did not want to make the same mistakes as the music industry, it was trying to sort of when it, when ebooks first began uh, entering the picture, they, the the publishers were very very careful, too careful, too cautious, uh, and afraid for, that their bottom lines would be impacted. Uh, and one thing led to another, and piracy exploded anyway. We're still fighting with it; it's still a major concern, um, and we really haven't as an industry come to any um, any set consensus in terms of, okay, how do we, I mean, I have personal opinions about it, of course, but when it comes to uh, how do we reconcile these frictions, uh, that that's the million dollar question. I don't think anyone's, I think that there've always been, there've always been lawsuits. This isn't the one you mentioned is, is hardly the first one. They go way back to the Google settlement, the Amazon lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera. But it's always publishers and authors on the one end and users and various websites uh, and even libraries on the other. Um, libraries, as you know, have been very vocal uh, about lending, uh, for them, it was a major shift in, in terms of how they delivered service to users. They went from buying copies and being able to do whatever they wanted with them, putting them on a shelf and rent and lending them out as many times as they wanted to dealing with digital content that could not be owned in perpetuity, that could only be licensed. And that really changed the game completely and made it very difficult for libraries to offer eBooks. Uh, in the beginning, in fact, the major, the, the four or five major publishers did not even work with libraries. It took a few years for them mm -hmm. to come on board and, and start experimenting with business models. Again, when we talk about business models and consumer publishing for eBooks, they are very, very different. And then of course, there is the 800 pound gorilla in the room called Amazon, which has given us so much because of the eBook phenomenon. I'm thinking of Kindle publishing and self-publishing and, and, and all of that. But on the other hand, it's also been very controversial and very 
in the opinions of many, predatory and restrictive, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been frustrating for everybody, for users, for authors, and for libraries. So um, let's talk a bit more about ebook lending uh, because that's one of your uh, that's one of your core interests, right? So um, could you maybe um, explain um, like how how does ebook lending work, uh, especially uh, when it's organized by libraries? Um, um, and maybe also we could discuss briefly how uh, how publishers not only use like like paywalls to to restrict access, but also how they use physical um, how they erect physical. Uh, walls to block the access, which is something that actually uh, all of us have experienced already when we try to, um, like, I don't know, transfer an ebook that you bought on, um, uh, or like an, a public domain ebook and trying to transfer it to your Kindle or something. Like, it makes me want to throw it against the wall <laughs> usually. So that's that's a very yeah, that's a good sure. example yes. of how, yeah, how uh, publishers uh, erect these physical uh, physical barriers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm. lending in libraries, in public libraries, ebook lending in public libraries is, is very complex. And of all the different sides or aspects of digital publishing, I would say that's the one that we struggle with the most and have made some progress, but not as much as I would like to see. Um, that said, I do understand the fears of publishers and the need to protect the content and to keep it behind paywall. Uh, but uh, I think it's at this point in the game, we've done this long enough, we've played this game long enough. Uh, we, I think we know that it's not working. What we don't know is how to make it work in a way that would uh, make publishers and authors uh, less worried about what happens if they, if libraries are able to lend books to users without any major restrictions uh, in a way that will not, and this is what they're afraid of, this is what's caused the friction and the confusion and, and, the, and, and these impossible, very, very disappointing user experience for, for library patrons is the fear that, as they say, that, that library lending will cannibalize print sales. Because print sales are is print sales, sales of print books is how most publishers still make their money, and this is true even on the academic side. So, I don't think that we have had to, up to this point any major studies that have seriously looked at whether that's true or not. Is it really true? Or this is something that I am taking more interest in lately. That if a book is available uh, and being lent out through a library that it is at that point that its print sales are not suffering. So that's, that's, that's the argument that drives the fear and, and the restrictions and everything that you as a user hate when you try to lend a book. Then when you try to, to take out or a book from a, a, a digital library. And also some of those frustrations include, as you know, uh, if you've ever tried to, to access an ebook through a public library, waiting lines, um, not having the book available when you want it, having an ebook disappear from your device if you didn't get to read it in full by the, the due date. Um, those are some of the frustrations that users have had. For libraries, the problem has been that ebooks have made it impossible for them to do what they're supposed to do, to service their communities, to make books available to people in their communities. So I completely sympathize with the Internet Archive. I think their argument is well made. And this was... Uh, an unprecedented time, certainly in my lifetime, what we've been through as a society globally for the past year and a half. Um, and, and in many ways, libraries have fought this battle with publishers, uh, some more success, sometimes more successfully than others. I will say that it's been librarians all along who have made a difference and they are, they are the reason things have, are getting better. So now we have these lending services like Overdrive, they've been around since the very beginning, who are offering more flexibility and more options. And it is, to be fair, getting easier and easier uh, and better to rent, uh, to access eBooks through public libraries. Not perfect, but it's getting better. Um, and this, is, this process started uh, 20 years ago. So when you look back to 2000, it certainly looks like we've made progress, but if you 
if you look at how other industries have evolved, I do think that that ebooks have some catching up to do. The the user experience is still inferior. Um, in my, and I'm, I may be now jumping ahead, but in my mind, you know, the, the business models that I support, uh, and for this, we need we need more courage in our industry. We need more leaders and more visionaries, more innovators, and, and more people who are willing to experiment and more companies that are willing to take a chance on some up and coming business models. We haven't done that as an industry. I've seen a lot of good companies, interesting um, startups do, wanting to deliver something fresh, something new. They come and go, they last a couple of years and then they just don't stick uh, because, and, and, and also, uh, Libraries sometimes are uncertain if they should work with them because they're not known to them. They're not familiar players. They're not familiar with their technologies. But I've seen some interesting new models arise that eliminate some of those frictions that uh, users experiment, but that users experience when when reading ebooks through their um, library apps. Would you see this as one of the main roles of libraries in this digital world? Like not only facilitating of or like uh, making sure that users have like a proper nice experience, but also encouraging these new business models and 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 experimenting. And while I say this, I, I realize that you know it's very easy to say that they should be more experimental or more courageous when you're you're in the time of budgets being cut all the time and and. Yeah, very True. challenging external factors. This is like what we've seen in the past one year and a half. That's true. Yes, that's absolutely true. And it's the most common thing I hear from librarians uh, that I've heard the last 20 years is our budgets are shrinking. Budgets are shrinking everywhere around the world, the United States, Europe. Uh, libraries are always um, on tight budgets. But what I find in my experience, I what I've noticed, it there's always... There's always a way, you know, there's always a way to experiment. It doesn't have to be on a larger scale, but I, I've i come to realize that there are leaders out there, thought leaders, uh, who are willing to embrace new things. And they are not always in the richest, most affluent universities or public libraries. Sometimes they come to us from small rural areas. They, they're run, some, I've seen a lot of library directors who are very open-minded and very proactively doing their part to give these small players or new business models or chance. And I've worked with them, so I speak from experience. So sometimes it, it it's always about the money, of course, but it's also about vision and, and individuals within the industry and their willingness to listen and open up and... Um, and learn something. And the only way we can learn is if we join forces and actually launch something together and, and experiment. And that doesn't mean that it will always work out, but we will certainly learn what works and what doesn't. So I think librarians have already been, they are already the reason why we've made progress, but I think that they can do a lot more. And by that, I mean on both sides of the publishing spectrum, both popular publishing and public libraries and then the scholarly community and academic libraries. I think that publishers are in a unique position to take the lead and transform themselves because their professions are changing, their roles are changing, their relevance is, is being challenged. Uh, and I think it's actually exciting time for them because uh, they have already influenced uh, a lot of what's happened on both sides. It is because of their vocal um, attitudes and their uh, willingness to, 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 to service their communities that publishers have, even when they relu were reluctant in the beginning, I don't know if you remember, but years ago, a lot of really good books weren't even available as eBooks for libraries. You know, we would only have certain, li publishers would pick certain books or test waters with older titles. They would not touch bestsellers or, you know, well-known authors. They would wait, they would impose embargo periods and you wouldn't be able to get that book to a library until much, much later. Uh, things have changed in that regard. And um, I think they will continue to, to change, but it really depends on the library community and how much, what they will eventually settle for. I certainly always encourage them to work with the small guys mm -hmm. and see what they have to offer. 
because you'd be surprised, you know, they, they bring some fresh perspectives into our industry that I think are much needed. Okay. It's a clear message. Thank you. Um, this interview will appear on a blog called World Culture. And um, we're curious to know if there was ever a particular moment where you, when you actually hit that wall and thought um, there's something wrong here. Like at what time did you see the light or <laughs> what, what caused you to see the light? In other words. Yes. Yes, actually it was. And it was working for a startup a few years ago and trying to help helping the small a company break into the library market by offering a completely new ebook model, ebook business model. And I thought it had a lot of potential and it was rejected left and right. Uh, the company fought a good fight for a good three years, trying to crack the, the US market first and then hopefully the European market second. Um, and what I liked about the model, and that's sort of like what inspired me to move into the open side, what I learned from that experience, and I, were, I, I, I partnered with them, we worked together for about three years, this idea of, oh, wait a second, ebook is not here to compete with a print book. It is here for a completely different reason. There, there's no competition between ebook, between print and digital. And I... The more I thought about it, the more I saw that people just didn't really think that way. I realized this is an uphill battle. Um, I realized that ebooks were really here to, to, to be open and to be to be available freely to users, but in ways that help authors and publishers not hurt their bottom lines or their you know income. And so for that, you know, I was inspired when I worked with these innovators who came up with ways in which they would. So they started opening, creating these so-called open libraries um, and making this content available freely through sponsorships, et cetera, et cetera. And it just, it got me excited because I realized we could have a world in which these libraries could be open and not connected to our zip codes and where we live. And there could be so much more freedom. And, and here's another big one. And not only that, but it dawned on me, and this was a big aha moment, that is the way to fight piracy. The library can defeat it. The open library, I believe, if, if envisioned properly uh, with proper business models, and we've been experimenting for a long time, we already know what works and what doesn't. Um, I believe that if, if we create platforms and open libraries, digital open libraries that are available to people, without restriction, uh, we are much more likely to combat piracy uh, and support authors and publishers than if we continue to fight piracy by imposing more restrictions and frustrating users and putting up walls instead of taking them down. So to, to, to sum it up, my, my, my greatest inspiration came from working from the small, with the small guys trying to crack a market where there are these big players who are, you know, very set in their ways, very traditional, protecting their old models, seeing how hard it is to be an innovator in book publishing in this day and age, and then learning from them and and getting to that point where I realized that ebooks and print books could coexist and not be uh, a threat to one another. You've written about uh, digital rights management in the pu book publishing industry, and could you explain briefly, briefly how it works and how publishers apply uh, apply this? And um, I'm also interested to hear, like, when does it work or when does it do its job, and when doesn't doesn't it do it? Uh, when doesn't it work? Um, and yeah, you already mentioned that libraries and readers usually believe that it does more harm than good. Um, I'm also interested in uh, any scenarios where both of these interests, interests can be reconciled. So to an average user or reader of an ebook, uh, the word digital rights management, the phrase digital right management or DRM means absolutely nothing. But to those of us in the industry who are on the inside, it's, it's a loaded phrase. We've, we've, um, been dealing with this for many years now, um, going back to the very beginning of the century when this idea, when it dawned on the publishing industry that 
copyright in and of itself is not enough. Just because something is copyrighted, it doesn't mean that it will be safe online. So tools are needed to help authors and publishers protect copyright. People often confuse copyright with DRM. DRM is not copyright. DRM is a way to, to enable copyright. So we use DRM to protect eBooks so that users can only do so much with them. It's like watermarking and, you know, uh, coding f uh, digital files with the technology that prevents users from sharing it illegally, or even in some cases, you know, if you're accessing an ebook through an, uh, an academic library, printing and, and, and email, uh, uh, copying, pasting, etc. So basically, any interaction with the ebook is that what you can do with the ebook is determined by how much DRM that ebook is coded with. And to make a long, very long, convoluted story short, uh, DRM has failed us in many ways. And we know that it's failed us because if it were that simple to, to protect an ebook with a technology that, you know, doesn't allow you as a reader to do anything but read a book, then we wouldn't have piracy ramp as rampant as it is. And it is rampant. It is unstoppable. As, as um, an industry colleague once said, it's like trying to make water not wet. It's impossible to stop it. And not only that, we know that there is no DRM uh, code that is completely uncrackable. So whatever book, however we protect the book, it's there's always a way for that book to be leaked and available online. So because we are still dealing with piracy in 2021, we know that DRM is failing us and not working. Um, in fact, it's frustrating users uh, because it's it's frustrated users for many years on the publishing, on the public library side or popular side, whether you are a consumer purchasing a book on Amazon, a library reader trying to access a book through a library app, or whether you're an academic visiting an academic library wanting to, you know, do research and, 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 and get to some books. So uh, it's, it's been frustrating all, all around, but yet here we are, you know, it's still part of the story. Uh, What's, what I think is, is, is good about uh, the whole story is that the industry is slowly awakening to the idea that, that frustrating users is not good. And not only that, but you know, DRM has frustrated a lot of authors because we simply do not have proof at this point that coding books with DRM has really been very beneficial. Uh, although some people agree on this, uh, it depends who you ask, but um, the, the way that DRM has been resolved on the academic side, as you may know, is through licenses, Creative Commons licenses. That's that is one way DRM works in the academic in the academic world. When you when you have an ebook that is given a proper Creative Commons license, then you know exactly uh, what you can do with that license and what you can do with the book. And there's a lot more freedom and a lot more flexibility for the user. I think that we should apply some of those lessons uh, to the popular side, whether that's going to happen, I don't know. But as things stand now, uh, we, what we've learned with DRM is, is simply that it's, it's, it's good in theory, but it hasn't really worked as well in practice. Um, and um, what's more, some people, many people have con con concluded that DRM has made it worse for many authors, especially for new authors and upcoming authors who are, you know, who have seen benefits from their books being read online. Uh, and of course you have vocal authors like Paulo Coelho. If you remember years ago, he created a, a website called, I believe, Pirate Coelho. He encouraged people to pirate his own books because he was convinced that that would lead to more print sales, not less. And if memory serves, that's exactly what happened in <laughs> Russia um, when the, when copies of um, The Alchemist skyrocketed when he himself made it open and available on a pirate website. So it's an ongoing debate. It really is. And there are a lot of opinions. Uh, I tend to be in the school of thought, you know, that believes that DRM does more harm than good. That said, uh, I don't think it's simple to open a book and make it freely available. I think we need to Sorry to keep using this word again, but I really do think we need to experiment because the ultimate enemy is not the user because most users 
most users are decent people who just want to read um, and they have no no desire or probably not even knowledge to pirate and, and share files illegally. But it is because of that small minority that we as an industry have to jo join forces and, and fight the common enemy. And that's, and that's pirate, pirate sites that are loaded with viruses and mm. just bad for everyone. So this leads to my closing question. Like, what do you see happening in, like, say, 2030? You think we'll, we'll have fixed this issue? I think that as time goes on, we will, I don't think print books will ever go away. I think that we are slowly realizing that that was not really, I, I don't think it's competition, certainly not on the popular publishing side. I think people love to read bestsellers and hold them in their hands. On the academic side, I think that they are much more used to doing research online and, and staring at screens for hours every day. I don't think they find as much enjoyment reading an, a novel on, on a big laptop screen. But I think that as time progresses and we move further into the future, it, it, it's open. The future is open. And so are libraries and so are ebooks. Uh, how we get there is yet to be seen. Maybe it's a combination of the models that we use today. It could be something completely different. I believe that digital content really wants to be free, uh, but what that perfect model is, I don't know. Um, but I can tell you that many different models already exist that uh, are very promising. And um, I just don't see a world in which 20, 30 years from now in which people still you know, buy eBooks and are married to a specific device uh, like they are today, certainly when it comes to Amazon. I think it's just going to be much more uh, in line with everything else, like accessing music on YouTube um, and sharing for the sake of sharing. That's, that's what I envision anyway.